So we're a very unique organization. We take a holistic look at the environment. Uh, we, um, we do research work. Uh, a lot of it's cutting edge. We do advocacy. Some of it's pretty hardcore. I'm not going to get into these. You can explore our website, <clears throat> the newsletters and the cyber active education program, uh, a lot of which is on hold because of COVID, except for this. And we are a land trust and we've protected you know, well over 1,500 acres of land right now. Part of a series we do every year. First time we've done this electronically. Uh, a couple more coming up. Uh, second Wednesday of each month, typically October through May. This year we started in January, uh, April 14th, Native Fish Coalition. It's going to be really good. Been working really hard with these folks on some endangered species legislation in Maine to protect those species like the Atlantic salmon and Atlantic sturgeon that are not on Maine lists, uh, even though they're federally listed and they are falling through the Maine cracks. Uh, they said this is recorded. Uh, um, and this on our home page is where you can find access to speaker series recordings down here under education. So <clears throat> with that, I'm going to uh, bounce back to here and introduce Chris Clark, who was good enough to be here. Uh, Chris was lined up to be a speaker of ours last year and got COVID out. It was a spring speaker. So graciously, um, uh, was willing to join us again this year and, and, and do this presentation. So Chris is a, a research professor and senior scientist in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at Cornell. And in addition, he's a part-time senior research scientist at Marine Acoustics, Inc. and director of scientific projects at Planet OS. Uh, Dr. Clark has a long history of successfully working at the, surf, at the interface between science, applied engineering, industry, uh, and regulations, all with the specific objectives of using science to understand the potential impacts of human activities on marine mammals and to inspire and enable the scientific conservation of marine wildlife and habitats. <clears throat> uh, Clark's work in this field began in 1976 with his PhD research on Southern right whales off of Argentina and continued into 1979 researching endangered bowhead whales off Point Barrow, Alaska. In Alaska, he collaborated with William Ellison, where they deployed <clears throat> some sparse arrays of hydrophones to locate and track migrating bowheads. Uh, the use of bioacoustics at that time was a new survey technique, and uh, the discipline previously had been, had been pretty much limited to visual observations. 1992, Chris was named Chief Marine Mammal Scientist for the U.S. Navy's Whale Wells 93 Dual Uses Program and continued his Navy affiliations for many years of studying effects on, excuse me, of sonar on marine mammals. Current research areas include studies on the potential chronic influence of cumulative man-made noise sources, for example, commercial shipping, seismic air gun surveys, what we've been listening to about in the movie, on large whale distributions, behaviors, movements in different regions, including British Columbia, Baffin Bay, Chukchi Sea, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Chris has engaged in many collaborative research efforts, integrating physical, oceanographic, and biological productivity measures, aerial surveys, genetic and photo ID data, and acoustic detections at federal, regional, and state levels. Uh, under his leadership, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Bioacoustics it's Research initiated a passive acoustic monitoring project uh, along the majority of the U.S. Atlantic coast in order to understand the spatial occurrence of critically endangered North American right whales and other co-occurring marine mammal species. As most people on this program know, right whales are a hot topic here in Maine, especially with the lobstermen. As a result of these ongoing major acoustic projects, a new ecologically based paradigm for evaluating and measuring biological risks from anthropogenic activities uh, at individual and population levels has evolved. And Clark's deeply concerned about the continued loss of marine mammal acoustic habitat uh, as a result of all this man-made noise. Uh, he's devoted considerable effort to scientific advocacy through documentary films like this one and um, Racing Extinction and other outreach efforts. And Chris is currently leading the development and application of a near real-time real -time 
auto detection network for North American right whale acoustic monitoring in the Boston shipping lanes. And he's published more than a couple hundred papers and given lots of presentations, including a TED talk. And Chris, before you start, and I mute myself, I just want to say I really, really appreciate the fact that you as a scientist are also out there advocating for the resource. Uh, I, I feel that really too many scientists that have the knowledge base and are very credible um, kind of avoid the advocacy arena. Um, and sometimes maybe they can't help that because they're working for like Fish and Wildlife Service or some entity like that. But given the opportunity, it's, it's, it's really appreciated. And as we always say with what we do, um, our research informs our advocacy. And, and it's great to see professionals like yourself doing that. So with that, I'll turn this over to you and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And here you are, I think. Uh, yes, thanks very much. And, and um, wonderful to e-meet or Zoom meet or whatever it is we're doing in this virtual world. Um, I'm interested in hearing some of your thoughts and some of your questions from this production. I note that that um, Sonic C came out five years ago and the world has changed dramatically in just those five years. And if I go back even before that, in 2009, a, a, a meeting, a small group of us met in Hamburg at the request of a, a, a very successful German um, businessman, but who had been in love with the ocean ever since he was a young boy. And um, his name was Dieter Paulman. And he invited, there were about 19 of us in the room. There were only four or five of us, maybe four and a half, you might say, that would be labeled as scientists. We had the head of the International Maritime Organization. We had a very high level executive from the World Bank. We had people representing laws of the sea, uh, the shipping industry, the cruise industry, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened in that three-day period was that the shipping industry, which before then had, um, had, had been uh, trying to behave responsibly, it was no longer cleaning out its bilges in the harbors of cities around the world. It was not throwing trash over the side of the boats and the ships, et cetera, et cetera. But they were um, unaware of the fact that, that uh, ships make a lot of noise, as you saw in this movie. Um, so this movie was actually made partially as a result of that meeting in Hamburg. And what you learn in that context is that the science, I'm a scientist, I'm a, you know, I'm double degreed engineer, I have all kinds of epaulets and medals and all that kind of stuff. But I have to tell you, I grew up uh, as a, almost like a wild dog on Cape Cod out here in Truro, which is I, where I'm sitting now in my grandmother's house, which was made and built in 1719. And I fell in love with the natural world. And I've always thought that everybody was in love with the natural world. But what Dieter did was he brought all of the different representatives of our society together in a very small group. And it was in that three day meeting, more got done with 19 people in one room for three days. than all of the scientific meetings I'd been to all of the large massive aggregations of people in Washington, DC, wherever we were to meet. And it was through that connection, that human connection, where we all agreed, we have to do something about our impacts on the ocean life. And the International Maritime Organization, the head of the Inter International Maritime Organization was there, he was a Cypriot. He had no idea that this was a problem. And he finally said to those of us who were trying to write these all these lengthy flowery sort of prose, he said, I want 200 words, I want it in plain English, and I want to be understanding. 
what's the problem and what do you want to do about it? And I said, um, let's reduce ocean noise from commercial shipping in, in, in half in, in five years. And he said, make it 10 and I'll do my best to make it happen. Ocean noise is now quieting ships. That responsibility, just like throwing trash over the side or dumping bilge water, noise pollution is now part of the charter of the International Maritime Organization. So the Canadians, for example, if you look into what's going on in, in Vancouver, um, the Canadians are implementing restrictions and incentives for quieter ships. Maersk, the largest uh, commercial industrial shipping company in the world has already retrofitted some of its ships. And as a result, the ships are more efficient because the propellers which generate cavitation, they generate all that noise. Noise means you're not doing a, an efficient job of using the energy from the propeller. They've already demonstrated that they can save themselves hundreds of millions of dollars just in a small fleet in a few months in the Pacific Ocean. So this is one of these examples where money is the driving motivator, making things more efficient is a sort of a, a mechanism towards reducing your cost. But more and more what we're seeing now is, oh, we have a growing sense of responsibility for a quieter ocean. And a quieter ocean is a healthy ocean. And that's sort of the, the gist of a lot of this. Anyway, um, I'd be really, really enthralled if you guys would ask some questions and let's have a discussion about this critical issue. Don't be shy. I, I have a question. I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off, Chris. Um, a technical question. Um, the way sound moves through the water, do uh, topographic or geographic bodies like islands or canyons or ridges um, provide refuge, refugia for marine mammals? And do they seek them out if, if that is the case? Um, I guess I would, um, yeah, that's a great question, of course. Um, what I would do is I'd sort of rephrase it or think of, think of yourself looking down on the ocean, like you're in a Google starship or a hovering satellite. And if you now, you can see the topography, the bottom of the ocean, like a National Geographic three-dimensional map, right? But now think of that also as, as showing where there are whole cold spots and hot spots or where it's noise aggregates or where it's really, really quiet. So yes, there are places where there is natural quiet because you are sheltered, you are, you are you know, sound is not entering that particular space. Sound travels in the ocean by, by moving, being refracted, just like light gets through a prism, it gets refracted into areas where it's sound is the slowest. So there's something called a deep sound channel, which is why I can listen to a blue whale singing off of Ireland. I can hear it on one of the instruments that I can make in a, you know, university laboratory off of Virginia, right? Uh, so you will find whales that will go and, for example, I've watched, I've observed whales that are migrating along a coastline and all of a sudden a seismic ship, which is over the horizon, goes active. And I can feel the vibrations of that explosion in my feet, right? And what the whales do is they go behind, they go into the shadow of rocks. They go right into the surf zone, almost practically up on the beach, anything to avoid that noise. Mm -hmm. So there are places where you could find uh, refuges, if you will, of, of quiet, but in, they're increasingly more difficult to find, or they have been increasingly more difficult to find, most, both because of ship noise, which is ubiquitous, and then from seismic explorations, which have diminished in the last four or five, ten years because of the changes in oil and gas uh, consumption. Okay, thank you. We've got a uh, Victor and after Victor, Robert have questions. Victor, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, hi, this is Jeanette here with Victor. 
and can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, and actually that was that was my question typing on Victor's computer. So it's really a question from Jeanette. So I don't wanna make him have to speak. So um, yeah, you know, I've seen some information about the use of uh, very large sail systems on large vessels, large shipping vessels. And it seems like that would reduce sound as well. The last time I saw anything about that was eight or 10 years ago. Is that being used at all? Is anybody still following that up or is that gone by the wayside for some reason? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I became aware of this as a sort of as an augmentation or a way of reducing the amount of um, hydrocarbons you would need to use to drive a ship but they were augmenting their propulsion to the through the ocean with these big sails. Um, I don't know of any any company that's really using that for a significant um, source of energy. Uh, next question from Robert Goldman. You want to unmute yourself? Hi, Christopher. Thank you so much. You're like a, a hero here. Uh, you know, you can. I, I've seen the Sonic Sea film before. I, I don't know if it was on PBS, uh, but you know when I heard the admiral say, you know, uh, he's not in the business of protecting fish. I thought, man, that guy should be court-martialed. You know, if he, he's not, he's supposed to be protecting life. And you know, the fact that he can't make the connection. You, how do you get to be an admiral and not connect the fact that you protect human life? You cannot protect human life without protecting life on earth. So how can somebody so stupid become an admiral? But that's not really my question. That's just a comment. Um, to, to get the sol to the solutions part of the Sonic Seas film was a lifesaver because after watching this, you feel like blowing your freaking head off. So the fact that there are solutions uh, and they're available now. The fossil fuel um, solution that already exists where they can send this very, very low frequency sound, is that being used or is that, do people drag their feet because they get used to the tradition of doing the sonic air guns? Uh, or is that being used now instead of the, the explosions to search for oil? Well, I do know this. Yes, these are um, very pertinent um, observations. And the situation has changed. So Sonic Sea came out in 2016, right? That was five years ago. And we all know that the world has changed considerably, certainly in the last 12 months and certainly in the last five or six years. Um, oil and gas, fracking, et cetera, et cetera, extraction and burning of fossil fuels um, is a generation that's coming way beyond me, my kids and even my probably grandchildren are well aware that that is not a viable solution for the planet and our existence. So you, I don't know if you, you read these things, but um, you know, when G G GM, that was a great example. What was it? A couple of weeks ago, GM comes out and says, after 2035, we're not building, selling fossil fuel driven cars, right? Well, that should have been a wake up call to somebody because this has been going on, this, this evolution of this has been going on now for a number of years, right? Um, the, hmm, what was the other part of that? thought was the, this move towards offshore renewables or wind. Well, as you, you may have heard, wind is now the largest generation of electricity in Texas, right? So these things are all things that we were told were impossible to do are now readily possible to do. We can become a more renewable um, society, a more responsible society. But we're, I'm optimistic. I'd love to hear your your optimism, but it's a it's a long battle ahead. Um, in the um, since I left since I retired from Cornell, I've now become a a consultant, if you will, a senior scientist working with Vineyard Wind, which is the first offshore wind company that we just got our 
we get just got through the environmental impact statement. We have records of decision that are now happening. So a, a wind turbine facility will be built in the not too distant future, south of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. These are all doable, but it's not um, an ultimate solution for energy, especially if we don't um, if we don't do something about our population, because we we live in a very consumptive environment and society, as you well know. And so these are so when when if I come back to this notion about okay, I'm a scientist, <clears throat> and I'm sorry. I've, I'm talked out because of um, my, my vocal cords are tired. Um, science can provide some answers, but most of these decisions, as uh, I think some of you realize, are based are societal decisions. They're science, we can only put so many things on the table and then we either adopt them and, and say, we're gonna do something with this knowledge or we're not gonna do it. And so that's where I think I encourage more and more of the students that I work with or ask me questions about how do I help? It's like, well, we need everybody. We need artists, we need writers, we need musicians. We need all the whole spectrum of humanity to participate in this solution because otherwise um, there won't be white whales in 30 years. There may be a few around, but there, there, there won't be. I don't know about you guys, but where I live, like we're up on Cape Cod, the, the bass, the stripers, I mean, the fish that were once extremely plentiful are hard to come by. The, the water is warmer, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So we need, to, we need to change our behaviors and we need to be advocates for, for the living ocean. That's my passion. I don't think I, Robert, I don't think I answered your question, but. We have it's time. okay, it's okay. It, what, what you said was just wonderful anyway. So, you know, I, it, it, is a, it is something that everybody has to get involved in. And of course, everybody won't, but enough people have to get involved in it uh, that it's talked about and, and people are talking to people in a position to do something. Shelly Pingree was on, uh, main NPR today. She's the uh, U.S. representative for Southern and Coastal Maine. And, you know, I, I wish this had been on top of mind. I did call in. I was talking about banning lead ammunition on night wildlife refuges. But, you know, hmm. this is, you know, people like her, she's on the Department of, she uh, is on Interior and Agriculture Commission committees. And, um, you know, we have to reach people in Congress, you know, everybody wants to live. And if we don't have a living ocean, we die. So this shouldn't be partisan. And I don't hear people talking about it, Chris, though, in the Congress, when people are talking about the Green New Deal, which I support, uh, nobody is talking about the Sonic Sea yet. And I, I think that is kind of sad uh, to to not hear any politician saying anything like what you just said, even for two minutes, two or three minutes. So uh, I don't hear the right politicians talking about it even at this moment. I've got a question here from Kermit next. Um, um, hi, it's, it's, it's Debbie Smith. Um, I put two questions in the chat. One of which oh. was what if, what if any commitment the oil industry had made, and I think that may be repetitive of the earlier uh, question about whether they're using the lower frequency um, drilling mechanism or searching mechanism, and um, whether an oil industry executive was involved in your Germany meeting, and what, if anything, that person had to contribute. And also, um, whether the pandemic significantly reduced shipping and whether we see any uh, positive effect in terms of reduced noise and also less stress on the mammals in the ocean. Okay, um, I remember the last question you asked and I remember the penultimate question you asked. I don't think I remember the first one. But if um, I can answer the, the question, when we had the, <clears throat> the German, the, the meeting in Hamburg, 
<clears throat> um, no, there was nobody there from the oil and gas industry. Um, that was clearly in a time period, even just those six years ago, when they were in a profound, still in a profound state of denial. And um, in some ways, I can empathize with an industry <clears throat> that has been basically charged or, or asked by society to produce fuel that we put into cars and trucks and airplanes and anything else. It's a hydrocarbon, it's a fossil fuel, and it's a really quick way of getting energy. And the things that the industry has done are technically phenomenal, but it's sort of like, well, building an atomic bomb is technically phenomenal. Um, but now those, those barriers of denial uh, have changed. They are definitely changed. And part of the change comes from the replacement of a generation of um, CEOs and CFOs in those, those companies by an, a younger generation. And there's a, a group of younger generation people in the energy industry that have known for a long time that, that fossil fuels for our source of energy was not sustainable. They're not in denial about climate change. They're not in denial about ocean temperature rises, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, one of the things, here's a, here's a great example. A few, few weeks ago, there was a lease sale for offshore wind areas in, off of Europe. And not one of the traditional world-class, largest world wind energy companies won a single bid. They were all outbid by oil and gas companies because the oil and gas companies have, what's the right term? A lot of cash, right? So th this is where you get the EPs and the shells, not ExxonMobil. They're still a little too Neanderthal for me, but the, these large traditionally hydrocarbon energy companies are all, all see the writing on the wall. And from just the point of business, they're shifting into renewables, whether it's um, um, hydro energy or it's wind energy on land or in the water. There's a massive shift that's going on right now. So that's hopeful. But I would say also that um, when was the last time any of you, any of you heard a politician, let alone had a conversation with relatives, friends, neighbors, about population control. It's just disappeared. And yet the growth of human population and our overconsumptive behaviors are what drive, it's what's driving the destruction of the natural ocean and the natural habitats of the planet. And we're just eating our children, we're eating ourselves. So um, there's a lot that's changed. So um, in this, uh, Steve Honickman, who was the um, chief counsel for the Secretary of the Navy, he was the man who got on in the middle there. He was the person who had the foresight to say when um, the Navy was building this uh, low frequency active sonar in response to quieter Russian submarines. He is the one, the individual who made the decision that this system, the Navy for the very first time, was going to come out and do an environmental impact statement. That was a major breakthrough. That was in 1995. The US Navy, the active fleets depend on sonar systems for protection, mostly, mostly it's passive defense. And they come out with that and it just opened the whole floodgate of, as we saw with Ken Balkan talking about the um, mid-frequency, high-frequency sonar impacts on driving rails up on the beach. And it's changed, it's changed the whole world of science and the whole world of scientific conservation in terms of uh, ocean noise. And you can't hide anymore. Nobody can sit there and say, oh, well, we're, we're immune. We, we, we do a lot of these things, but that's okay. We can just keep doing it. So we're gonna see, you're gonna see, pay attention, or maybe you already do, just you're gonna see example after example after example of quieting the ocean, our footprints in the ocean because there are no known deaf marine vertebrates.
that, that's all the fishes, right? Clearly all the whales and the seals and the turtles. That you can't survive in the ocean if you're not deaf. And next time you pick up a crab or a lobster or some a shrimp, look at all the little tiny hairs all over the body. Those are all sensory systems for not for pressure necessarily, but for vib vibration, acoustic communication, predator defense, all that kind of stuff is all, all very, very essential and dependent upon sound. Um, there was a, an experiment, oh, what was it, three summers ago uh, in Australia where there was an active seismic survey going on and some scientists with support from the government went out and monitored all the krill and the, the little tiny organisms that su support the whole life system there. They, they documented unambiguously that when that seismic survey vessel passed through that area, it killed, killed 100% of all the krill, a fundamental layer of ant organisms that feed the ocean's ecosystem. And what one of the things we heard back from the industry was, well, you, you only did you didn't really do a full blown experiment, so that's, that doesn't prove anything. And then there there was the other issue where we had um, up in Maine, up in your neck of the woods, New England Aquarium, and scientists were up there year after year studying right whales, and they've been collecting um, tissue samples and and snot when they blow and measuring. Um, hormone levels. And one of the hormones they, they measured was a, a stress hormone. And when we had 9-11, the ocean went quiet. The airplane stopped flying overhead. Shipping industry, shipping dropped precipitously. The ocean became noticeably quiet. And because they, the New England Aquarium folks had all this baseline data, they were able to show that the stress hormones dropped precipitously, right? And that was, that was something that some people who are sort of denying of ocean noise in fact said, oh, that's, that's only one experiment. So you need to do more experiments. And our, you know, our community's answer was, oh, I see. So you want another 9-11. That's the only way we're gonna convince you that a quieter ocean is a healthy ocean. So the evidence is now, denial is, is pretty much out of the way. Uh, in terms of making headway into this quiet and ocean issue. So that's, that's a profoundly um, important because, as you know, denial can be a nasty thing to try and overcome, whether it's in your family or it's in yourself or it's in the community. So that there is a lot of progress being made. I just hope we can make it fast enough to make a difference. We've got a couple more questions here. The next one is Vance. Vance, you're up. Yeah, well, uh, I, th I think you may have sort of answered this already, uh, but it was actually kind of coincidental. Um, you, you mentioned lobsters. Um, and I was just completed reading The Secret Life of Lobsters, which <laughs> I haven't read it. It's a fascinating book and how they use the sense of smell um, in the ocean. So. Uh, Footnote to Ed, I'll be mailing the book to you tomorrow probably. <laughs> um, but um, you know, my question was really beyond uh, aquatic mammals, what other, uh, yeah, you've touched upon the krill, so, um, but is there any other major, uh, you know, aquatic groups that, are, that we know are adversely impacted by, by the sonic pollution? Well, we know there's increasing evidence about fishes. Okay, so that there are vertebrates. Um, the invertebrates are gaining more attention because, first of all, most, most cases you don't need permits. You can keep them in tanks. Um, they're, not hard, they're not as hard to come by in many cases as a, you know, a 50 ton whale. And I actually um, think of right whales and these big, you know, charismatic megafauna, as they're called, as really the um, the, the person at the head of the 4th of July parade, you know, out there doing all this kind of stuff and leading everybody else. So they get a lot of attention and sometimes they're, they're good looking and, you know, you'd say, oh, wow, look at them. They can, they can flip, they can do all these acrobatics and twirl. Um, right whales 
have a uh, whales, as you know, uh, there's the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So they have legal standing, right? That's why NRDC can be so effective because they have, those animals have laws that our society has carved into, you know, stone clay tablets that say, thou shalt not do the following thing. There's nothing that protects fish, right? There's nothing that protects invertebrates from our misbehaviors. And yet, as I think you're implying, if we mess up those ecosystem layers, everything else comes tumbling down. And um, I said before that there are no known deaf marine vertebrates. And more and more, there are, there, there are scientific studies and not necessarily being carried out in ivory towers, but, but many of these studies are being done by entrepreneurial young folks, right, on their own, demonstrating that, my God, um, well, look at, look at some of the work out of uh, the um, octopods, right, the um, cephalopods. I mean, they're, it's like, wow, they have ears. They have ears that look like convergent evolution. They have, they, I thought they were just bags of water with, with some things sticking out of them, right? I was like, no, these are highly evolved animals, all of which have mechanisms that are dependent upon listening for sound. And many of them are complemented by, as you said, you know, these, oh, I'm jumping around, sorry. Um, I am never surprised at what nature comes up with in the evolutionary complex. Don't ever underestimate what nature will do. <clears throat> you know, bees shouldn't fly, birds shouldn't fly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those, those layers <clears throat> of life <clears throat> are what support ours. And if we continue to be so arrogant as to think that we are stewards of the sea, um, well, we've failed at being stewards of the sea. And yet it's still an you know, ambition of ours, but I think we need to re uh, readdress what that means to be stewards of the sea. Having a responsible relationship with the ocean does not mean that you eat it. It means that you respect it and you, you, let it, you let it be just for what it is. Because as you know, every other breath of oxygen you take comes from um, reduction in the, in the ocean. Before you lose your voice, uh, we've got Linda up next. Linda, can you unmute yourself? I see the question. Is that is that the uh, shipping sonar seismic? Yeah, that was what I put in the chat. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> hey, can I share a screen with you? Sorry. Can I yeah. share a screen with you? Yeah. Absolutely. It's really hard to communicate with you. It's impossible with words, even with poetry and beautiful language. Have you guys read the, the book called The Overstory? It's a beautiful novel. Um, okay, so I wanna show you some, an animation if I can. So if I launch this or maybe, okay, I'm gonna launch this and then I'm gonna share my screen. Now, if I, oops, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see the screen? Yep, we got it. Okay, so this is an animation. I'm showing you a voice print of a blue whale. This is 18 minutes long. It's like a musical score. Time goes along the bottom from left to right, and pitch or frequency goes from low to high. Can you hear me? Yep, gotcha. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So <clears throat> and these are individual notes of a blue whale singing. It was 650 miles away when I recorded this. 
And it's so low that it's called infrasonic, it's below your hearing. And I'm just going to play this. Right? <clears throat> and now, how do you going to be able to hear it? No, you don't hear it. Okay. Can you hear that? Yes. Yes. So that's the voice of a blue whale 650 miles away. I've sped it up 30 times so you can hear it, right? Wow. Um, here is a, um, um, the result of a, an animal down here in the Caribbean singing. And these are the, this is the transmission space over which that, that voice of that whale can be heard throughout the north, western North Atlantic. So here's Florida. Here we are up here. There's Cape Cod, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Labrador, right? This blue dot is the, is the island of Bermuda. And what you're seeing is the sound shadow of that, oops, that whale's voice around the island. And you can see that the sound is outlining the continental shelf along North America. This um, jagged part here is the refraction, defraction um, of the sound through the mid-Atlantic ridge. This is the underwater mountain range that goes right up the middle of the Atlantic, right? So this is the scale over which low frequency sound propagates in the ocean, right? This is, this is all physics, it's all ocean physics. So you can see that there are hot spots and, and, and cold spots of the sound, but I'm only showing you two layers of the sound field. So this is a, this is a track using the Navy's anti-submarine warfare system that I've been using since 1991 to track whales. This is the, the path of the blue whale. This is Bermuda right here. These are the New England seamounts that come out of the um, um, Gulf of Maine. And the animal came down here, went right by Bermuda, came down here, turned around and came north. And right here, the animal spent 10 days in a cold water eddy. These are, these are oceanographic features, which are likely high density food, rich areas that the animal is probably feeding. Then it turned around and disappeared into the Gulf Stream. So this is, I'm showing you this, this is the scale over which sound, particularly low sound, um, is propagating in the ocean. And last, then I'll get back, I'll get to your question about which, which is the worst heffalump? Is it, do I, do I want to be terrified by an orc? Or is there a sorcerer up there and a tower is going to turn me into a toad, right? It's this kind of thing. Um, so this is the picture, this is the voice print. Time runs along the bottom, pitch runs up here. And these are the, this is a visualization of an explosion of a seismic air gun survey searching for oil and gas. Now this is supposed to run. It's a little different on, I've never done this on Zoom before. It really is. Okay, here we go. And that's the, that's the sonar system of the ship locating itself. I haven't sped that up at all. That's every 10 seconds. They will do this for weeks and weeks and months at a time, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth throughout the ocean. And that's the scale over which these, these insults into the ocean. It's just exploring for hydrocarbons, which we then use and put in our cars and trucks and homes, et cetera, et cetera. So these scenes um, occur for um, many, many months of the year. Several years ago, there were 35 such 
surveys going on in the North Atlantic Ocean. And when I ask my friends who are in charge of, for example, the UK um, process by which you have to apply for a permit if you're going to go offshore west of Ireland or in the Orkneys or someplace like that, you're supposed to apply for a permit. But if you're in international waters, you don't have to pay attention. You can just tell people to go quick change. So this, that's the scale. So this, for the same reason I can hear a blue whale off of Ireland, off of Virginia is the same reason why I can hear an explosion from oil and gas exploration off of Virginia when it's happening off Labrador. There's their surveys off of Northern South America that are happening at a time. So the ocean just gets flooded with this noise. And the Navy, I will tell you because I worked very intensely on modeling or empirically modeling the footprints of ships, seismic, and Navy activity, Navy, Navy training activities. And the Navy, amount of energy that the Navy is putting into the ocean uh, acoustically is dwarfed by the shipping and by the seismic exploration for hydrocarbons. Absolutely dwarfed. Um, but they all have different, uh, you know, one's an explosion, one is constant noise. So it's, it's a little bit like you living in a, a fog bank all the time and you can only see a foot in front of your face and it's sort of constant, you know, um, fog, noise fog versus every 10 seconds, you know, an explosion goes off. And we, science does not know the impacts of these things because it's hard to scientifically ask the question. We're not going to go out and sacrifice whales just because we want to find an answer to the question. At least I hope we're not going to do that. And we have to be, we have to use the precautionary principle. We have to say we we respect life and we will not destroy it just so we can have a couple of good years of uh, party time um, on the mainland. Right? Um, I, I hope, I don't know if that answered your question. I'm, I get very passionate about this. Uh, I want to show you. Let's see, did I show you this? No. Are you still seeing that screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Cape Cod Bay. No. Yeah, so let me show you. This is, this is, um, this is from, um, an animation of real data collected in this area. So uh, Boston is over here. This is the shipping lane coming into Boston and out of Boston. Provincetown is right down here where there's Scituate, there's Gloucester, and most of you I presume were up, up north of where I was on this map. This outlines a Stellwagen Bank National Sanctuary. And all these little glowing lights, like stars in, in a Van Gogh painting, these are all the acoustic footprints, if you will. This is the space that a, a white whale generates with its voice. And so with, if the two animals are close enough together and they're, the light of their stars meets, that means they can communicate with each other. This is the footprint of a small commercial vessel, most likely either leaving or coming back into Boston. This footprint right here, oh, I should mention, when the light of a whale, the voice of a whale is completely obliterated by the sound or the noise from the ship, it disappears. So there might be whales underneath this thing right here. And what this thing represents is there was a liquefied natural gas terminal that was built about um, uh, 2006. So that's you know, 15 years ago, built here to offload liquefied natural gas onto back onto the mainland for fuel and marine, right? And it's being maintained and positioned by bow thrusters. So it's making a lot of noise. I'm going to show you this is an animation. We had 89 right whales in this area, and you're going to see mostly commercial ships moving in and out. Okay, so these are all this is all real. We had these are the paths of the ship, you knew how loud they were, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a, a reasonably sized ship coming in right now that goes in. But you see that when that 
this is the this is the concept that's really hard to get across with numbers and tables. But when you look at it, most people go, I had no idea. So a commercial ship coming from Venezuela, for example, and now they're not going to be Venezuela anymore, but Trinidad, right? Loaded with fuel coming north, a regular commercial ship, that footprint will have a radius of 200 miles. So the entire diameter footprint of that ship would basically obliterate this picture. Right? That's the that's how noise from ships impacts ocean acoustic health. So you have explosions, you have ship noise, et cetera, et cetera. And so there is no one thing is better than the other. We want to basically reduce noise from all of them and improve basically the behavior of people as to how they treat uh, the ocean. So I have good friends at the Center for Both to study. They want to buy a new boat or they a new or a new boat. And I say, well, before you invest in that vessel, you must make sure that it's quiet. And if it isn't quiet, you don't buy it or you haven't fixed it. That's the responsibility we have in a future quiet person. That is anything. Thank you so much. And we have one last question before we hand it back over to Ed and that Victor, uh, Jeanette, is that you that has a question? Next question. Uh, that was me again, actually. Um, so uh, actually, thank you very much for, for your movie and also all this commentary. I just wondered if there, if you are aware of a map that would show the overlap or possible overlap between noise pollution and the plastic pollution that's so ubiquitous in the ocean these days. I do not know of that. Um, I do know that there are, that's, a, that's actually a fabulous, that'd be a fabulous animation. Um, the scales are, I don't know what we have in here. So I shouldn't be ruminating in front of you and sort of postulating things. Um, but there's a very good friend of mine who lives right up the road from me, uh, Laura Ludwig, who engaged in uh, plastic uh, rope and uh, those kinds of things in the Gulf of Maine intensely. Um, uh, I, I presume you must have seen some of these um, movies or, or um, the synthesis of the amount of plastic that's in the ocean. Um, yeah. It's pretty horrifying. Well, um, well, yeah, I mean, there is information out there about the enormous amounts of plastic um, that are being accumulated in, I guess, gyres in the ocean. But also, I mean, it, you know, you can see on, if you Google it, you can see movies of plankton, you know, the, the plastics decompose into small microplastics. And you can watch plankton eating the microplastics. And of course, then the fish eat the plankton and then we eat the fish. We're, we're eating our own plastics. It's really gross. So I just, yeah, I just wondered if anybody had sort of compared these two things. They're both terrible, but it, I guess there may, I mean, it sounds like you may not be aware of such a thing, but I should go look for one. It might be interesting to see if it exists somewhere. You know where I would check? Um, there's a fabulous um, assemblage of people um, hosted, really enabled by the Pew Foundation. And they have annual meetings. They didn't, didn't have one last year. Annual meetings, many times they're out in Jackson Hole or some beautiful place to go to, um, where you get this integration of people. You get this, you get, um, and this is when you sort of go from the artists, the musicians, the linguists, the poets, um, all, all aspects of human creativity, including the scientific side of life. And you, this is where you get this synergism. And that would be that they have these special sessions where they have artists, um, you know, filmmakers um, showing off new stuff or technologists saying, well, I got a whole new kind of camera. And I, that would be the kind of environment place where I would expect something like that to, um, oh, you know what I could do? Um, Louis Sahoyas, who is the, um, the, the filmmaker who um, won an Oscar for The Cove, 
of a movie about the Japanese slaughter of dolphins. And I worked with him on a movie which was called uh, um, Racing Extinction, which was his next film after that. He was, uh, I should, I should uh, make a note and ask him um, for his suggestion, because this is where you, as a scientist, we're not encouraged to step out of our comfort zone to explore these sort of um, risky, career risky kind of things, right? Um, and yet it's, I totally fundamentally believe it is through those mechanisms of human creativity and risk tolerant behavior, if you will, right? That you basically say, well, this is where the sparks fly and we get our inspirations, right? This is why you get up in the morning and you're tapping your toes and you're listening to the birds and you're dancing in the street, right? Um, and that's what we as a culture need to embrace and enable and, you know, fertilize in our culture as opposed to, oh, well, I, I want to watch another sitcom tonight or whatever we, we tend to do with our time. But those kinds of um, questions are, you know, when I saw some of those, those um, uh, what was the guy's name, Jordan is his last name. He, he put on that, he's put on some of the great campaigns about plastic in the ocean, right? And, you know, when you see these, these albatross, you know, that dead carcasses on the beach and you see the turtles with a, you know, being strangled and things like this, you're going, what in the hell are we doing, right? Um, and seven, with 7 billion people, uh, it's not gonna be long before there aren't albatross, there aren't turtles, et cetera, et cetera. And those of us who believe in the majesty of life and the magnificence of a living planet, my attitude is, this is all that life is worth fighting for at this point, right? Because and I'm, I'm getting a little philosophical, but it's just like, well, yeah, but it's it's when you get those synergisms. There's a woman that if some of you want to write this down. Her name is Asher J. A S H E R J. She is a young, she's Indian by birth, and just a brilliant communicator, artist. Um, an artist that doesn't do her justice, right? Um, and you look at the things that she's done. She put she did put art all around New York City to demonstrate the beauty of the living world, right? And so people can see it and they ask about it and they think about it. And um, this is where when I'm uh, trying to encourage students or even my colleagues about our responsibility as scientists, we have to be act activists and advocates for life, not for our careers, because our careers are going to be short-lived otherwise, right? Um, anyway, you, you get a sense of um, what I'm trying to say. And I think as long as we all respect each other and hold each other's hand in some way, shape, or form and share as much of our passion as possible, that's, that's how I have hope, right? And we need hope. We need all the hope we can get. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. This was as wonderful as it is uh, disturbing or as disturbing as it is wonderful. I don't know. Um, but uh, again, we really appreciate the, the work that you've been doing. And, yes, and it, and it won in uh, 2017. It, was a, uh, it, it won the Emmy for Nature Documentary and it won an Emmy for um, Music and Sound. Right. And it was nominated for another one. So well, it's quite a good film. Well, thank you again very much. Thank you everybody for coming. And remember, we'll be we'll be on the air again the second Wednesday of um, uh, whatever the next month is, uh, April, right? And uh, and 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 thanks to uh, to Martha and Arthur and and to Martin. Uh, hopefully, within a few days, we'll have this up on our website as well, so people that missed it can can uh, can watch and listen. Thanks so much, Chris. Hope to see you up in Maine sometime. Well, thanks for all you do, everybody.